So welcome everyone to week three uh, for the Well 40 class at Mount San Antonio College. And this lecture, I wanted to talk to you about cylinders, oxygen and acetylene cylinders that we use in the welding industry itself. And uh, here I have a sample of an oxygen cylinder. It's cut away here uh, for you to be able to get a good view of it. And uh, I'll try to scan down so you get a good view of the full size cylinder itself. And it's just safely uh, sitting on the floor. And so, a few things on this and how they make it. First of all, this cylinder is seamless. Uh, there's no welded joints in it. Uh, it's made from a single plate of steel, uh, which is heated, and it's passed through a mandrel, passed through so it has a plunger. So you can just imagine a flat plate of steel with a plunger, and it's passed through a mandrel several times. And what, you're in, what you end up with is 220 cubic feet, and you end up with a nine and one eighth inch in uh, diameter uh, cylinder. Uh, it weighs uh, about 145 pounds, uh, so they're not light uh, to move around. But one of the key things I want you to know about this cylinder is that it's filled to 2200 PSI. And I know that's just a number that's written on a board there, uh, but I want to tell you, 2200 PSI is a tremendous amount of pressure. And uh, I've been on the end of lines that are just running at 100 PSI, and I had to cover my ears uh, with the amount of noise that it made exiting. Uh, so with 2200 PSI, this cylinder can actually become a projectile, can actually take off. And I know there's some programs on TV uh, that have shown these uh, taken off. Uh, those are real videos. Uh, so one of the things we want to do with these is we want to take care of them in a safe way. And so we're going to talk about those aspects of it. These cylinders are made under the uh, jurisdiction regulations of the Department of Transportation. And I'm going to, I'm going to move this out of the way for just a moment so I can talk to you uh, more about it. Originally, it was the Interstate Commerce Commission, and uh, the Interstate Commerce Commission dissolved in 1995. And at that time, they just got absorbed by the Department of Transportation. The Department of Transportation was started in 1967. So what I wanted to say here is that it falls under the rules of the Department of Transportation. So they're considered shipping containers. And uh, so you have to follow, and not anyone can just make these cylinders. You have to follow the rules and regulations of the Department of Transportation when you go to manufacture them. So again, they're stain, uh, uh, seamless, and uh, they're filled to 2200 PSI, nine and an eighth in, in diameter. Uh, nowhere within the thickness of a wall is it less than one quarter of an inch, anywhere. The markings of the cylinder itself uh, and we'll, we'll, uh, uh, I'll be more specific in just a moment, but I want to just tell you that on the side of the cylinder, it's either going to be a 3A cylinder, which is a manganese st uh, steel cylinder, or a 3AA, a chrome molybdenum, which is a higher strength uh, steel as far as the oxygen cylinder is concerned. Also on the side of the cylinder, uh, it's either going to have a star or it's not going to have a star. Uh, if it has a star on it, it gets tested every 10 years. Every 10 years, and the test dates get stamped on the side of the cylinder. If there's no star, it gets tested every five years. And any cylinder over 35 years old uh, gets tested every five years. So on the handout uh, that I gave everyone, and I'll try to do a, a close-up here so you all can see, Typically, it says whoever owns the cylinder or purchased the cylinder themselves. Uh, it says who owns the cylinder right here. Um, and then it'll have the markings. And in this case, it says ICC, uh, which means that it's an older cylinder uh, prior to 1995. So those are still in existence. 
Um, also here, you're going to see the test dates here. Uh, 7 at 82, 7 at uh, 82, 7 at 92. Um, so here's the test dates right here. And in addition to that, this says that it's a 3AA cylinder, which means that it's a chrome molybdenum cylinder. And uh, what's not marked properly on this handout is it doesn't have a star. And it should have a star on, on this particular handout, meaning that if it's a 3AA, it should have a star, which means that it's tested every, every 10 years and you can see the markings on it. The only other note here, uh, this is his, uh, you know, some history, is it says 2015 at the very end of that. And the reason why it says 2015 is because they used to fill these to 2015, uh, but there was such a demand over World War II while the war was going on that the industry decided to raise uh, the, the pressure within the cylinder to 2200 PSI. And because there were no incidences, uh, cause no problems throughout the industry, uh, that 2200, I, uh, 2200 PSI was kept. And since World War II, we have been at 2200 PSI. Now keep in mind that 2200 PSI, that's at 70 degrees Fahrenheit. So if you're in a cold part in Alaska somewhere, uh, they're at 30 degrees Fahrenheit. It's like any gas, it, it you know, concentrates itself when it's cooled and it expands uh, when it's heated. So as it contracts at, at uh, 30 degrees Fahrenheit, you're gonna read 2000 PSI. And as it expands at 100 degrees Fahrenheit, you're gonna read 2400 uh, PSI. But most importantly, if you go to get a cylinder filled and you pay for it, you know, that costs anywhere from uh, $50 to $60, something like that. When you go to get them filled, you should put the regulator on and you should verify that they gave you 2200 PSI. If they didn't, you need to get a hold of the supplier, uh, whoever supplied the gas, and let them know, hey, I'm missing a couple hundred PSI here and I need to be uh, credited for, for it. Um, that's not an ongoing problem in the industry, but I just need you to know that a full cylinder of oxygen has 2200 PSI in it. So I'll roll the cylinder back here and talk to you about a couple things about it. Um, one thing is, is that it has a brass valve. And uh, this brass valve, as you all know, and you've demonstrated here in the lab, that whenever we open an oxygen valve, it's always open all the way. So I wrote that here, valve is a double seat and it's opened all the way. So the proper way to open an oxygen valve is you would just crack it, just allow the gas start to flow. And then at that point, you would open it up completely all the way and you wanna set the double seat. And that's what I wanted to show you right now. Um, here's the double seat in the valve right there. So as this gets open, it protects the stem of the valve itself as it gets open so that the 2200 PSI, which is a tremendous amount of uh, pressure, uh, doesn't leak. Um, so whether we're at a manifold system or whether we're using it here as a cylinder, always open the oxygen valve all the way. The other safe uh, part of this is that the oxygen cylinder, in case of a fire, it has a bursting disc right here on the side. You see this brass uh, nut here. And it's actually a brass disc in this shape uh, there. And uh, should this be in a fire, as opposed to the cylinder itself actually exploding, the bursting disc would give way when the pressure within the cylinder exceeds uh, the, the proper uh, pressures it would give way. And this is designed to allow the, the oxygen to be released without actually propelling uh, the cylinder somewhere. Now that being said about propelling, I do wanna to talk to you about that for a moment. Typically when you're dealing with these oxygen cylinders, they're gonna be in a roll cart. And that roll cart should be chained off. Uh, so before you move a cart, 
uh, you should make sure that the chain itself is secured before you're actually going to move it somewhere. But it should be chained off. Um, you don't want to have a cylinder that's full just standing here by itself because, as you can see, that if this was to get knocked over for whatever reason and this valve hits something, whether it's a wall or something else, it has a potential of hitting this brass valve and then, the, of course, that would cause the bottle uh, to take off in, in a direction because of the pressure within it. So we want to be very careful when we're moving these. If we're going to move them, we put a, a steel cap over them. Uh, you see the threads here on the outside. I'll be demonstrating the steel caps when I go over uh, the leak test or the, what they call the drop test. Um, so I'll show you about the, the metal caps that go on here. But anytime you're going to roll these, put the put the cap on it and uh, then unhook the chain and then roll it somewhere. I don't suggest that you use um, a rope. Um, be careful about that because a rope can catch on fire. I mean, preferably uh, a chain or something non-combustible is what's best to secure these. Uh, if the rope is the only thing that you can use, you definitely don't want to have a fire near that area. Obviously, the, uh, you know, you'd have an issue with the rope itself. The cylinder needs to be secured uh, while you're using it. And uh, one of the things on one of the projects when I walked up, uh, one of the welders was using the oxygen cylinder and it was literally sitting there like this next to a tree. Not secured at all, not tied off, but it was sitting on the roots of the tree off at an angle like that. And uh, I immediately went over I didn't even ask the welder, I just arrived on the site and I shut, the, I shut it off and uh, I took the cylinder and I laid it on the ground. And then I went over and I talked to the welder and I explained to him why I did uh, what I did. Uh, usually on a, on a project, when on a, any kind of a job site and I arrive on something like that and I see something unsafe, the proper thing to do is to go to the superintendent or go to the foreman and you explain to them what, what you're looking at. Uh, usually, for the most part, that always takes care of it. If not, then I get safety involved. I've got to call someone from safety, and uh, whether it's the contractors or my safety department, but one of the two, uh, we're going to get that resolved and we're going to get those uh, cylinders secured at the project. This particular cylinder, and I'll roll it, I'll try to roll it, see, hopefully this works. I'll roll it as close as I can, everybody. Right here it says ICC. So you can see that this is a really old cylinder. Um, and then it goes on and it says 3A. So we know that it's a manganese steel. It's not the higher grade steel. Um, believe it or not, this says uh, re-stamped at 2015. So originally it was stamped here at 1800. So this is really telling you the outdatedness of this cylinder where they filled it to 1800 and then the pressure was moved to 2015. And then after World War II, we went to 2200 PSI. The other thing to note here is that it says uh, USN, United States Navy. So it's a, it's a it's a Navy uh, cylinder from a lot of years ago. Um, I was looking for the test dates on it, and it looks like when they cut this section of the tank out, uh, they removed the actual test dates. But one of the things that you need to take note when you walk up to uh, an oxygen cylinder is what are the test dates? Has it been tested? Um, is it a 3A or a 3AA? And uh, so it hasn't been tested in the proper uh, time. So let me talk to you about that for just a moment. Try to roll this to the side. So if it has a star, it's tested every 10 years. If there's no star, it's tested every five years, as I said before, and over 35 years, it's tested every five years. You can look at the test dates on the side of the cylinder and see if it's current, see if it's up to date. If it's not up to date, take it to your local supply place. 
As I said, when I first started talking, these are shipping containers, so they fall under the rules and regulations of the Department of Transportation. And uh, they have to be properly uh, uh, tested and they have to have the proper dates. The rules and regulations are, is that your general welding supply, uh, air gas, your supply, who's ever supplying you the gas, they're gonna be the ones that own these cylinders, not the individual people that are, that are using them. Now, I'm not saying you can't own a cylinder, you could probably go to the swap meet and buy one, but typically if you get one there, it's gonna be outdated. You're gonna to have to take that to air gas and, or you know, supplier of some sort of the oxygen uh, gas, and they're not gonna fill it. So they can charge you to test the cylinder and uh, bring it up to date and stamp it and then fill it with 2200 PSI and give it back to you. Or for the most part, and what they'll probably do is just take the cylinder from you and then give you one that's already been tested and, and already charged at 2200 PSI and give you that cylinder back into your possession with a nominal fee type thing. But typically that's how the industry go. By far and large, Everywhere you go, the, the people that are using the gas do not own the cylinders. Uh, here at Mount San Antonio College, the cylinders are delivered here, and we just consume the gas. And the driver uh, drives up, delivers 40 uh, cylinders, picks up 40 empty ones, and they drive away. So we're just a consumer of, of the gas within the cylinder uh, itself. But a lot can be told to you uh, walking up to an oxygen cylinder uh, with a lot of, of information. One of the things I didn't mention to you is that the bursting gifts give way every once in a while. They have failed in the industry. Now, I've been around a whole lot of oxygen tanks and I personally have never seen one fail. But I just wanted to tell you that the bursting discs, they do give way. And if they do, it just releases the oxygen and then uh, it would go back to the supplier and they would put another brass disc in place and reseat uh, the, the brass nut and put it back into operation. And it's a safety mechanism for the cylinder itself. So I think we've talked about uh, just about everything I wanted to say. We are using 99.5% industrial grade. So uh, um, it's not quite 100% oxygen, but it's enough uh, for us to do our work in the welding industry. Uh -huh. So when you walk up to a cylinder, look for the dates tested. Look for approved places where they're stored. You don't want to lift by the metal cap protecting the valve. You don't want to lift by that. It's only there to protect the valve itself. Uh, we do call it oxygen. We don't call it air. We just call it oxygen. And uh, I'll just take a moment uh, here at the, uh, at the college. We have what's called a manifold system. Uh, and I have a sample of a regulator. So I can just show you that. One of my later lectures is gonna be uh, about regulators. But in a manifold system, you only have the operating pressure. You're only dealing with the operating pressure itself. So the cylinders are fill, cylinders fill the pipe that comes from the supply and it goes in through a piping system to all of the stations where the welders are and they're using that gas at the station itself. And uh, we call that a manifold uh, station because the gases have already been reduced uh, to about 80 PSI at the supply. So that the most that you could get at any of the stations at one time would be 80 PSI. My point being is that the pressure has already been reduced before it gets to where you're using it. And it's, in a, it's a safe operating pressure uh, for you to use here at the college. We don't want the cylinders to be knocked over. We don't use oil or grease with these. There's no oil or grease used on any fittings, 
whether it's hoses, regulators, torches, cylinders, no oil or grease, nothing that can be uh, potentially uh, flammable. I'm trying to think if uh, there's anything else to say about these, and I think we, uh, we've talked about most of it. All right, so uh, from there, we'll, we'll leave the oxygen and we'll talk about acetylene. And I'll do the same with the acetylene. I'll scan the uh, camera down so you get a view of this. And you can see that the acetylene cylinder has a filler in it. It's a hard filler that's 92% porous and 8% solid. And I'll make another attempt to readjust this camera. So it's solid. The other thing about this acetylene cylinder is that it has fuse plugs in it. There's a plug right there. And we're missing the two fuse plugs here at the top. They fell out of the cylinders, but there were two here and there's one on the bottom of the cylinder, as you can see. So as I set this down, it kind of goes out of view. I don't know if I, if I set it here, if you could get a view. It'll be in the way of the lecture. So I, I, I just want to talk to you about it. For when we talked about the acetylene gas, it's unstable above 15 PSI. So at no time on your regulator should the pressure be above 15 PSI. It's a hydrocarbon and the hydrogen will separate from the carbon. Uh, pressures increase, temperatures increase. Uh, it is definitely a problem. Uh, so at no time should we be above 15 PSI. This cylinder, when they fill the acetylene cylinders, they fill it to 250 PSI. So there's got to be a way to stabilize the gas within the cylinder itself. And the way they do it is with a calcium silicate filler. Uh, what I want to say at this time, there were some pre-fillers. Uh, they used a magnesium oxychloride. Uh, they tried asbestos discs. Um, but this is early days, you know, this is, this is 1904. They were trying to put this together. Uh, turn of the century is when this uh, industry really started around 1900. But they were trying to stabilize the acetylene gas and they used those pre-fillers and eventually they figured out that the calcium silicate filler was the best. And so everyone in the industry started using it. In essence, it's made from asbestos, silk fiber, charcoal, sand and lime. It's 92% porous and 8% solid. The other thing about this uh, acetylene cylinder is that they use acetone. And uh, acetone, it's a flammable uh, liquid uh, that absorbs 24 to 35 times its own volume. Acetone in the industry is used as a degreaser. Uh, a lot of mechanics use it to clean tools and uh, things of that nature. Uh, so uh, we used to wipe down pipes with it, uh, you know, uh, just to clean them off. The issue with that, depending on where you're at, is that it's flammable. And there's several places that don't like flammability liquids around. So you'd have to find some other uh, way of getting a degreaser without it being flammable. But the acetone itself, for every uh, atmosphere, 14.7 uh, PSI, if you're a diver, you know, and you're going into water, you get into another atmosphere for uh, each uh, uh, atmosphere at depth at 14.7. So it, it increases in temperature. I mean, increases in, in pressure uh, as you increase the uh, pressure within the uh, cylinder itself. 
And the only way to, to balance that is by having the acetone uh, in there that's absorbing the acetylene gas within the calcium silicate filler. And that's what stabilizes this gas within the cylinder itself. The other thing to tell you is that the, the cylinder valve is open one and a half turns every time. Every time you open up an acetylene cylinder, it's open one and a half turns. There isn't anything in the industry, uh, torches, tips, anything of that nature, uh, that you can't use acetylene with at one and a half turns every time that you open it up. The reason being is that this is the flammable gas and you wanna be able to shut it off very quickly. So if there was a valve to shut off, that's the one to reach up and to turn off. Should there be an issue with whatever you're cutting or whatever you're welding, I would reach right up to the acetylene uh, valve itself and I would shut it off. And that being said, you've only got one and a half turns uh, to shut it off. And that volume at one and a half turns will run the largest tip, the largest torch, the largest rosebud, if you will, everything within the industry you can run at one and a half uh, turns. Well, I'm just gonna tell you a story real quick. I was uh, working at a Navy ship. I was uh, uh, working at the shipyards and I was a welder. And I had strung the hoses out uh, onto the ground and uh, I was cutting on the side of the ship. I was in, we were in dry dock and I was cutting a hole and the hose caught on fire. Now I, ha I have a lecture on hose uh, coming up, but I just wanted to tell you about the one and a half turns. Um, the hose caught on fire and uh, I, had, I had a fire watch with me. Uh, they, they were the Navy people on the ship and he was in the compartment with me and as soon as the fire started, I ran around the hose and I went over. It was a manifold type setup. So when I got to uh, the piping system and where the hoses branched off of this manifold system, reaching up and shutting it off at one and a half, um, there's a reason why the industry does that. And so I did shut off the flammable side of that and the fire watch that I had with me uh, put the fire out. Of course, all the alarms went off in the fire uh, uh, department within the ship itself, which is a very serious thing uh, on a Navy ship. Uh, they all eventually went to the space, but uh, thankfully uh, my uh, fire watch had done his duty and he put the fire out at the hose itself. The next day they had hundreds of Marines out there and the captain of the ship called the Marine ahead and gave him a medal. Uh, for putting the fire out uh, within the compartment. But I just wanted to emphasize to you that importance of the one and a half turns, that if you're in a bind like that and, and you know, shutting uh, the gas off, it's important. Okay, so we fill it to 250 uh, PSI. The cylinders themselves are strength tested at 600 PSI, so they literally fill it with uh, air uh, to 600 PSI, and then they lower that pressure down to 300 PSI, and they immerse it into water. And so they do a water immersion uh, leakage test at 300 PSI. The valves for the acetylene cylinder are much simpler. Uh, they're not you know, the double seats like we have with the oxygen cylinders. Uh, so those don't need to be open at one and a half turns. I mean, I'm sorry, they, they don't need to be opened all the way. They do need to be open one and a half turns every time uh, you open an acetylene valve. So again, even with these acetylene cylinders, you don't wanna lift by the caps. Um, the other thing you don't wanna do with these is you don't wanna use them in the horizontal position like this, because if you do, you'll draw the acetone out of the cylinder. If your flame turns purple, you have drawn acetone into your regulator, into your hoses, into your torch. Uh, that's not a good sign for you. So you're gonna to have to take that cylinder and re-stand it up. 
I'm not saying that you can't put them horizontally. You can. You can just put them in the back of your truck and, and move them somewhere, secure, you know, with the cap on if you're moving short distances. Uh, but once you get them there, they should be stood straight up and uh, let's sit, let it sit for 15 minutes. Uh, and then, then you can put the regulators on and then you can start uh, drawing uh, the gas itself. But just know uh, these aren't used in the horizontal position. The oxygen cylinder doesn't matter. Doesn't matter if they're horizontal, vertical, upside down, whatever. As long as the cylinder is secured and it can't move, you'll be just fine. Either way, both these cylinders need to be secured. They need to be chained off so they're not gonna tip over and fall or the valve isn't gonna be uh, disconnected for whatever reason. I wanted to talk to you about the fuse plugs on this. Uh, I showed you the fuse plugs earlier. So there's two fuse plugs up here at the top and there's one at the bottom. Now that's the safety mechanism for the acetylene cylinders, should it be in case of a fire. And uh, the fire situation for these, uh, obviously if there's a fire, the fuse plugs would melt. The fuse plugs melt at 212 degrees Fahrenheit, same temperature the water boils. So please keep in mind, if you're in Alaska and you've got a bunch of ice all over these, you don't wanna take boiling water and just start dumping it uh, onto it. You could, in fact, it's a special alloy fuse plugs and you could melt it. Uh, so be very careful of that. Um, warm water is probably the best suggestion if you have, uh, you know, some ice buildup. But the fuse plugs would melt in the case of a fire and these holes are designed to disperse the acetylene gas so that the cylinder itself doesn't give way. So I guess one of the things I wanted to ask right now is, is I talked to you about the safety mechanism for the oxygen cylinder and using a bursting disc. And here the acetylene cylinder uses a fuse plug. So my, my question to you is, is why doesn't the oxygen cylinder use a bursting disc? So you can give it some thought and think about it. In all the years that I've been teaching this course, uh, which is quite a few years, I only had two students answer it properly and they just said it immediately. I had bits and pieces, but just two of them just said the answer to me right away. And of course the answer is, after you hear it, uh, is that the bursting discs, they give way. They fail sometimes. And when you're dealing with a flammable gas, uh, like acetylene, there can be no mistake. Uh, the only way this should give way, as far as the acetylene gas, is if it's in a fire situation. So that's why the fuse plugs are used, and uh, they implemented this uh, 212 uh, water boiling uh, temperature in order to disperse it, which you know is getting into the temperatures where you're around uh, a fire situation. Um, you want to keep the valves closed on the empty cylinders. Um, you don't want to tamper with the valves. Um, I don't put any wrenches on these, by the way. They're all hand, hand open. Uh, there, there's no pipe wrench going on and tweaking on the side or anything like that. Uh, just use your hand to open up the valve and uh, that's, that's all we need. You don't want to strike the cylinders with anything. You don't want to hit, you don't want to use them for rollers. You don't want to put them on the floor and, you know, try to move this piece of equipment, you know, somewhere. Keep away from the heat. Um, and the only other thing I wanted to say is that these are typically in a cart, like in a moving cart. And if you're going to store the cylinders, OSHA requires a five foot non-combustible wall. You can make it out of concrete or you can make it out of uh, masonry. Uh, but if you're gonna store them near each other, you gotta have a five foot non-combustible wall between the two storage areas. Um, 
If you don't have a five foot non-combustible wall, they need to be 20 feet apart. So those are the OSHA rules. Either you store them 20 feet apart or you've got a non-combustible wall between them wherever you're storing uh, the cylinders. And that's about it. I, I have a, a slight story. I hope uh, this doesn't take too much time, but we're dealing with a flammable gas here with the acetylene cylinder. So I'd like to close with this. I, I just want to read this to you real quick. Uh, it's how they make an acetylene cylinder. Uh, the cylinders are weighed to determine the exact volume. Filler is mixed. Calcium silicate filler is mixed with water and weighed for one cubic foot. The sample is weighed to ensure the correct mixture. Cylinders are then filled and weighed again by knowing the mixture's weight and the cylinder's volume. Weight now decides if the cylinder is properly filled. The cylinders are oven baked at 500 degrees Fahrenheit to remove all the water. Bake time is about 40 to 120 hours, depending on the cylinder size. The cylinder uh, is weighed again to ensure that all the water has been removed. 1% moisture will affect its uh, performance, so if slight moisture is red, the cylinder is rejected. Fuse plugs are then installed. Um, the cylinder is then shot blasted and painted. Final strength proof test, the 600 PSI, those tests are ran. Uh, then it's reduced to 300 PSI and ran uh, into water uh, to make sure it withstands the 300 PSI for any leaks. Then it's drawn into a vacuum and the cylinders are charged with acetone and it's weighed to determine a full volume for the acetone. A number is selected from each lot. Uh, these are charged with uh, acetone and tested to ensure proper discharge. If specifications are not met, the entire lot is rejected. So they'll take a, a sample of these, of the lot that's made, and they'll test them. So here's some of the test. The bomb fire test, designed to check a cylinder's performance under the conditions of a building fire. A fully charged cylinder is placed horizontally on a rack with wood chips are ignited around it. The cylinder passes if there's no shell bulge, no penetration of the filler by decomposition, and there's no breakup of the filler. Flashback test simulates the torch flashback entering into the cylinder uh, at its full pressure when the operator closes the valve immediately. If the, if the flash is quenched within the cylinder with only a minimum decomposition, with no release of the fuse, fuse plugs, the test pass. Hotspot simulates negligent use of a torch flame used in the cylinder. So they actually take a flame and they direct it right at the cylinder until an eighth to a quarter inch bulge develops. And if nothing more occurs, decomposition is limited to the heated area the test pass. And lastly, the bump test determines filler resistance to mechanical shocks. The cylinder is mounted onto a foundry mold bumper and subjected to 200,000 bumping cycles. Satisfactory performance is no sagging or cracking of the filler material or the calcium silicate material itself. My point being is that these are fully tested uh, before they're put into the industry for use and uh, it's meant to be used safely and if we go about using them safely it's a very very uh, safe way uh, to uh, operate move and use uh, the gas within the cylinders themselves so this will uh, conclude um, I'm trying to think if there's any other comments that need to be said about this and I think that that, that will that'll conclude the lecture. Thank you.